Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast with Benji Nice. And despite the false alarm on Twitter earlier, I'm back for the recap of one of the better stages of this Tour de France so far, Stage 16. This show is brought to you by our show partner, Lacole. That little rat thing in the corner thought it was going to, you know, get on the microphone today. Incorrect. <laughs> I had a pretty bad crash um, this afternoon or before around midday descending Rabassa descent uh, in Andorra and a lady walked out in front of me and I just went full mash front brake and slid out so I didn't break anything which is good but it was uh, you know like at 55 60 and I basically have no skin on my right side anymore but um I'm hopped up on on painkillers so I'll have some spicy takes at least maybe it's it's good uh but yeah glad I'm all right and uh it, it did remind me that as like a self-employed person, I guess, or running my own my own company, like it's scary to think, you know, during the Tour de France, I was like, shit, I can't, I need to make money to live like during the tour now. It's not like <laughs> I don't get sick leave. Anyway, onto the stage, Benji's going to fill you in. This is the first big mountaintop finish we've had in quite a while, finishing on Col de Portet. Some say the hardest climb in this year's Tour de France, 180 k's long the stage, flat for the first 115, then Peresuda, Col de Valoran, Azet, and then Called the Portet, which is 16, 17 Ks, 8.5%. But yeah, Benji, fill me in what happened uh, with the brake formation. At the start of the stage, it took quite a while before the breakaway started, but we know that this is a very long run in, so it's likely that a breakaway forms in the initial 100 kilometers of the stage, completely flat. And we saw that the Koenig was playing with that a bit, was trying to control it a bit at the start of the stage, probably making sure that Matthews or Colbrelli don't go in the breakaway, stuff like that. Gav was at the front looking at that and so forth. But eventually a break got away and it wasn't a strong breakaway. It was the kind of breakaway where you thought, okay, if they don't have 20 minutes by the bottom of the Pedersurde, they ain't winning this stage. And I think that that became relatively clear as the race went on because some teams had the interest of setting a pace at the front of the peloton. We saw that Israel was moving forward and also one rider from Arkea, so about one third of their team that is left. And um, they were trying to prep something for a potential K1 battle most likely because also Quintana and Woods were not in the breakaway. It was basically Perez and a bunch of people, including Dorian Godot and such. So not the strongest breakaway. Perez, by the way, he's the guy that last year, I think, on one of the hill stages in the middle of the of the Tour de France, was fighting against Cosnefa on the hills, and Cosnefa was in the polka dot jersey. Perez took it over virtually in the stage, and then his team car crashed him out somewhere in the end. And that's how he didn't end up wearing it on the podium at the end of the day. So actually a pretty sad story looking back at it, but um, yeah. looks good to see him back on the bike and see him climbing so well because uh, he was arguably the strongest climber in the breakaway today. For sure. But um, let's go back to a peloton because there was an intermediate sprint just before the climb started. And we saw the Koenig move towards the front and ready for action. And I think that it looked like Cavendish was going to get it the way that they were prepping it. But Matthews actually had a very good lead out there. He was led out on the right side of the road and they flew past the train of, of the Koenig. Merkel was not fast enough on the left side of the person in front of him to move forward and try and catch up with that. Basically, I think that they could have done exactly the same as Alpesin did at Schildepreis. They were faster than the Koenig and they didn't move to the left. That's where they could have already made the difference. But eventually, the gap that Matthews created with his lead out was enough because Merck was in the wheel of Matthews and Cavendish in the wheel of Merck when Merck just went to the left and stopped. He, he was done. So Cavendish had to close the gap to Matthews' wheel before the sprint started. Yeah, Then you know you're going to lose a sprint most likely. And uh, Matthews wins the sprint there, takes the points, but let's be real. It's one point difference or so with Cavendish, so he's not yeah. that much closer from this, but was still a fun sprint. But we get to call the Pedestal where the action's about to start, and we see that the action of that one Arkea rider has brought the peloton to around 8 minutes 30 going into the climb. And that's when we see a move after that rider is done, which is Baron Quintana attacking off the front. And we see Woods closing that immediately, clearly a battle for a KOM, right? Because, like, do you think that they had the intention of trying to go for the stage afterwards as well? No, not really. And I think Woods seems to have focused on polka dots in Paris since the Molma stage, Benji, because he didn't offer a pull at all when yep. Chavez and Aguita attacked on the last climb. He just sat on trying to take the poke, max poker points available to him. So I think he's going for polka dots. It's really, as we said on the uh, maybe the rest day podcast, it really depends on what the GC guys do because if it's back-to-back GC days, they're in trouble. 
uh, for polka dots in Paris. There's double points, 40 available at the finish today, 40 available uh, tomorrow on Luthard de Den. But just before we get into, I guess, the meat of today's stage, mention our show partner, LaCole. I apologize, LaCole. I did enjoy the uh, lightweight bibs and uh, jersey that I was wearing today, but they are no more, those ones. But LaCole produced performance cycling apparel. They've been supporting the podcast since pretty much this, uh, the Giro last year, since the podcast inception. And if you want to check out any LaCole kit during the Tour de France, you can use code LRTDF20, that's all caps, LRTDF20, to get 20% off all items, even if they're already discounted. But yeah, Benji, pretty much... I saw the break on PCS when I was in the hospital bed. I was like, eight minutes, those guys, not enough. UAE, it, did it look like they were pretty much, they, they actually wanted to honor the stage today. Eddie Merckx would be proud. Yeah, it had his reasons apparently because uh, I noticed from, I think, uh, Jose Ben on, on Twitter that posted that Alan Piper, the DS of UAE yeah. and also a mentor of Pogi himself, it's the only day of the Tour de France that he's there as he's fighting with uh, yeah. against cancer right now. and. Yeah. He's uh, having that ongoing battle. Hopefully, he can he can beat that. And it was the only day where he was in France, and I think that's why Pogacar was so willing to try and go for this specific stage. And obviously, he also wanted to win in the yellow jersey as well. So I guess we'll find out in a bit if that actually happened. But UAE was indeed pacing it. It didn't feel like it was a super slow pace. I feel like they had set up. I oh, want to spend X amount of domestics on this climb. Keep these riders toward the last climb. Stuff like that. And eventually, the only rider that they didn't catch from the Quintana attack was Latour, because he kept on attacking. Latour just kept on attacking and riding 10 meters before the peloton. It's It's Bastille Bastille Day. Day. Yeah, it's Bastille Day. I mean, I felt like a bit of an idiot today on the bike. Um, But then I I came home, watched Pierre Latour, and I was like, I'm not the dumbest person to ride a bike today. Uh, (laughs) Just sitting three meters in front of UAE pacing and then re-attack. I mean... Listen, I mean, it's actually kind of a meme, so I, I don't mind it. I, I appreciate him doing it. <laughs> it was, he then got dropped so like soon afterwards. And uh, I think Mihai tweeted on uh, tweeted like he's going to attack the group header if he can later, which I laughed at. But yeah, some <laughs> random things going on. Basically, Godon and Perez then I saw with like 50k to go. Those two are the strongest, two French riders out front for Copidus and Azure Desert Citroën, UAE pacing. But the gap on the base of, sorry if I missed anything, Benji, but the gap on the base of Porte was like four minutes, yeah. not enough. It's a hard climb, goes yeah. up to 2,200 meters. One meters. thing is that we saw Kwiatkowski dropping very oh, early. Oh, yes, I missed that. Together what with Mark there? Cavendish. And he, I don't know what happened, but he took something from this one year car and smashed it on the floor. So it didn't look like it was, oh. Like Vini oh, just, style? Like uh, in, the, in the Giro, remember when they threw the bid on on the ground? <laughs> on the Etna? It wasn't that crazy, but... It, <laughs> It, it didn't look like it was, oh, I'm done for. Like, it didn't feel like that. So right. perhaps he had to, like, wait because he's going to be useful tomorrow. But that that's a bit sense. odd. No. I, I don't know. There has to be more behind it. But I, I honestly can't guess it. So let's go back to the reins. We've got Perez and Godon fighting on the Col de Borde by now because UAE was pacing the entire three climbs now. And honestly, at a certain point, Godon attacks. He looks like he was the strongest. Perez comes back. And then Perez attacks and drops Godon. So I guess he blew himself when attacking Perez and Perez just kept it up for a while. But I'm afraid that his gap was around four minutes at the bottom, like you mentioned. And then we saw that McNulty and Micah hit the front, both of those riders. And I swear that I saw the time gap going from 3.30 to two minutes in about three seconds. (laughs) Yeah, we had some weird time gap issues, but like the gap went to 250 and then it disappeared and went back to 330. And I was like, I don't think Perez is out pulling Micah uh, in the GC group whilst people are getting dropped. And people are under pressure pretty early, actually, with the pace behind. I'm not sure. I think Thomas was dropping. Port dropped really early. We saw um, Bilbao and Turns were there. We had some, we had Woods hanging on, Godou hanging on, Valverde drops early. And I guess, yeah, the McNulty pool really started to drop all the domestiques and then the Micah pool started to put some GC contenders under a lot of pressure. Uh, they eventually catch Perez, I'm not sure at what point. But we've still got like, I think like over 8Ks to go, 8.5Ks to go, Micah flies past him. And I think, I can't really remember if anyone else pulled it all, Benji. I think no. Pogaccia basically told Micah, do one last sprint. There's a flash 
Castro tried, yeah, true. For a tiny bit, not sure. I think just because we had some people drop already, Enric Mas, and as that happened, perhaps he was like, oh, let's put someone at the front and put a bit of pressure there, I guess. I guess. I mean, Castro has been fantastic this Tour de France. I mean, probably the and best. And the Giro. Yeah, he's been crazy, the Tour, after that Giro. But yeah, Michael went on the front, and then Pagatra attacks with 8Ks to go on a flatter section on Porte. He's... Like as I, I want to stress, <laughs> eight k's to go is a long time on this climb. Like that's so far out. He just attacks. He's got Jonas on the wheel. Kuz can't respond. He's dropped at that point. We see Masters already dropped. Miguel Angel Lopez looked like he had better legs today. It was my pick for the stage. He has to go back and help Enric Mas. Uh, and then we see O'Connor actually responding. And I was like, I was saying, Stroud was like, stop Ben, let them go. Just. I know yeah. it's so negative. I was like, but just fight for like fourth or something because you, you, you don't want to go over your limit. And Kelderman did the opposite, right? Kelderman didn't respond and he rode his own pace. And Uran, do you reckon Uran went over his limit today, Benji? Because he seemed yeah. to be in a bad way straight after. Yeah, probably. And the thing is like he tried to follow a bit when Pogacar went and Vingogo was in his wheel and Uran was in that wheel. And those four had a bit of a gap and Carapaz ended up having to bridge that, pass a few people to that wheel again. And then we noticed that Uran, and not at that moment yet, but Pogaccio went again, because I swear that his DS asked him today, how many times are you going to attack today? And Pogaccio just answered yes. And uh, <laughs> I think that he went again and Uran was off the back. And then we had our three musketeers left. That was it. And that was Pogaccio, Jonas Vingigo, and also Richard Carapaz. And then the interesting dynamic started because... Who's going to start pacing? Who's going to try and save some energy? Who's going to try and do something late? Ah, oh, I was hyped. And, and just a reminder of the GC positions going into the stage. Uran was second, 518 behind Pagacha with a 14-second lead on Jonas and with a 15-second lead on Carapaz. And if you build in an expected time loss for Carapaz in the TT on stage 20 for Uran, he needs a decent amount of time on Rigoberto Uran, but he's not pulling in that group. Whereas Jonas... He's going to, okay, say Uran drops here and, you know, he only takes five, ten seconds. He's still going to beat Uran in the TT, one would think. So Jonas is like basically in virtual second in Paris straight away the minute they drop Uran. But he's the one exchanging turns with Tadej Pogacar and Carapaz is not pulling at all. And I, I, I fall for it literally every time, Benji. He's such a convincing yeah. guy. He's always sitting at the back and... We just saw it at Tour de Suisse and I think others were saying Carapaz sitting on, looking a bit uncomfortable, doesn't necessarily mean he's going to get dropped. That being said, I do think, Benji, that – well, actually, I want to ask you, why was Pagacha trying to drop them so aggressively when he's got the massive time gap on GC and you'd expect him to smoke these guys if they lead him out in the finish? I think that it is quite simple as he wants to – cause a very entertaining finish and he wants to finish solo on top of Col de Porte. I don't think there's much more than that because like if tactics are a thing and if he's scared or not confident enough, he's going to sit up and he's going to sit in there real respond to their attacks because he is the rider ahead five minutes. He's got plenty of time. He doesn't need to do this. Neither of this. Like he didn't need to attack with 8k to go. <laughs> he didn't need to attack the other about <laughs> Until 15 Paris. times. And exactly, didn't need to attack till Paris. He's the better time trialist on paper anyway, according to the last time trial. So yeah, in all honesty, he did that because he wanted to make a show and because he wanted to win the stage. And I thought that he would have dropped them at some point there. I thought, Pogacar is looking absolute fire today. He's, he's going to drop them here. And Jonas was so, so strong, staying in yeah. his wheel every single second. Richard Carapaz not taking over because Carapaz knows, well, if I take over now, these two guys have a, a kick as well. But if I take over now, then I don't have the energy to potentially sprint them in the end. And I don't need to take over, really, because they're bringing me further away from Uran right now. So exactly, I'm fine yeah. with that. And he's got that podium relatively okay, knowing well, Uran is behind. It's not sure yet. But, yeah, I don't know if he did at the time. Like he didn't know how yeah. badly Uran was cracking. If he's only twenty seconds behind, I mean, yeah, I've, I would risk it. Yeah, and since that's what Ineos made a decision that their best stage result so far on this tour was sixth. They've yep. got no guy on the podium yet on GC. 
So I, it really looked like Carapaz wanted the stage win to salvage something from this tour and, you, you know, thinking I can probably get third on GC anyway. And so, yeah, it's Pagacha attacking over and over and over again. We don't have the exact timestamps. He attacked a lot. Jonas didn't really attack at all. And then with like oh, 1,200, 1,300 meters to go, we start to see Carapaz dancing in a bigger gear at the back of the trio. The pace has gone out. Pagacha is attacked for the last time. He's probably just going to wait for the sprint at this point. He knows he can't drop them. And Carapaz has a big, big attack, kind of like that Vuelta one where the stage Roglic did win, but they attacked each other from far. It reminded me of that. He's got Pagacha on the wheel glued to his wheel. Jonas is dropped, but he's able to claw it back to, to their wheel. He gets back to their wheel with 250 yeah, meters but- to go. I do want to come in for like one second. I think that it's very important to note here that you've indeed got Karapas at the front with that attack with Pogacar in his wheel. The gap to Jonas Vingega. The problem for Karapas is he kind of tricked himself because from this point onwards, he cannot stop pacing. He has to take time on Vingega. So he needs to start pacing and keep on pacing with Poggy in his wheel while Vingega is still behind. And he has to keep that up because that's tactically the position he brought himself in by having Pogacar still in his wheel. And yeah, like you said, Fingergo was crawling back and uh, was certainly looking better and better there. And maybe Carapaz went a little bit too early. I'm not sure. It seemed like he did peter out a little bit at the end. They get to about 150 meters to go, uphill finish, and Pogacar just absolutely launches it and immediately gaps. <laughs> Everybody off the wheel basically does finish solo, winning this stage. Carapaz actually loses time on the road. Wingergaard comes around him, riding a bit steadier in the final K, coming second, three seconds by Pagacha, taking the six bonus seconds to Carapaz third on four seconds. Fourth, David Godou, who couldn't close Conrad on Aspet, uh, called Aspet Porte, whatever it's called, Porte um, Aspet. <laughs> <laughs> yesterday. He, came, he comes fourth, best Frenchman on Bastille Day, on a minute 19, attacking out of the GC group. O'Connor beats Kelderman by 14 seconds. Bilbao, four seconds behind. Igita, he did a fantastic job pacing Uran today. He finished on a minute 49 in a group with turns. Mas on 2.27. Lushenko losing a lot of time down at 2.53 on this finish. So Uran, I think I mentioned it. I looked at his mountaintop finish results recently in the last 18 months, two years. And it is where I think he'd been hiding a little bit this tour and he was exposed today. So the revised GC, Pagacha. 5.39 ahead of Jonas, who moves into second. Carapaz into third on 5.43. Maybe he has a there's a battle for second tomorrow. Uran on 7.17 into fourth. O'Connor looking good. 32 seconds ahead of Kelderman in fifth, but the TT's coming up. And then there's Mas, despite the terrible day, moves into seventh on 9.48. Then Lutschenko, Martin, Bilbao rounding up the top 10. Uh, but yeah, quite a memorable stage, Benji, particularly Carapaz Hollywood performance. I really enjoyed the stage, genuinely. And it has that dynamic where, like in that front group, you had the the playing between Vingegaard and Vingegaard, sorry, and Pogacar and Karapaz. And it felt like Pogacar and Vingegaard were both like talking together, gossiping behind Karapaz's back at certain points, trying to drop him here and there. And Pogacar even like said, oh, come on, take over. We got to drop this guy at a certain point with his elbow. And I was like, okay. <laughs> it's so clear and so transparent that they want to drop Karapas, who was sitting in the wheel. And I did enjoy that as well. But I think that Pogacar won in his yellow jersey. I, I know that. I don't think that. <laughs> and as a consequence, I think that I'm quite happy to see that. I think it's always awesome when the leader of a Grand Tour can win in their leader's jersey on one of the mountain stages that matters. I think this is arguably potentially the queen stage of this Tour de France parkour-wise because it's not like we have crazy other stage. I think tomorrow is another one that will be very fun to look at. Yeah, I think that when it comes to the rest of top 10, Uran is definitely the loser today. He still had Hegita so strong. Yeah, said great, to Higita great today. Higita. Great ride. Karapazm did what he had to do, took time on somebody that was on the podium and therefore is now on the podium and I think they're going to be happy with that and I think that Kwiatkowski can try and get that thing that he dropped on the on the floor angrily that he took from this one year and be happy again because uh, they did it what they had to do it's it's not winning the Tour de France but they were in a much better situation than they were yesterday and uh, that was necessary when it comes to Carapaz because now they've got a gap of a minute 30 plus on Uran if they can keep that 
I'd even try and trust that in the time trial against Iran with Karapas. Yeah, it's a pretty solid gap. It's a minute 40 even. Uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a, Iran's not like the best time trials in the world. And yeah. Karapaz can do an okay result. Tomorrow stage from Pal to Luz Den, two climbs. Tourmalay, 17K, 7.5% after 77 k's the intermediate sprint is after a 2k six and a half percent climb we'll probably see matthews trying to take max points on cav again tomorrow uh he should be able to drop him on that climb one would think and then the last climb lose out again 13 and a half k's seven and a half percent much more regular gradient sort of always around that seven to eight percent not as hard as today i think it's a stage where wealth and art and coos can make much more of a difference and uh yeah i think but the question is, will anyone really control the break, Benji? Because it was up to UAE today when they didn't have to. They did so because of the reasons you mentioned. They've got that win in yellow. Who do you even see controlling? Hmm. I think that the benefit is that it's a shorter stage. 130 kilometers might be a consequence there, where the gap might not have expanded to 8 minutes to 12 minutes yet. It's still a pretty large climb, but it's not as large as the Gold of in kilometers. So... I think this might be very close when it comes to breakaway and peloton. I'm I'm not actually sure what it's going to be yet. I think that Pogacar doesn't need to go for it yet. Uh, again, I think I had him once again for this stage in the preview, but I might go for a breakaway finish on this one. Because like, you'd say that a cut up or something, if they were far behind, they'd go for a crazy attack on the Tourmalet, but right now, nah, if I'm nah, cut up nah. I wouldn't do that. Because nah. like, you're on the podium. Sure, Vingigo is ahead of you. You need to try and take time if you want to end second. But, like, does it matter if you're second or third in the Tour de France? I don't know. Maybe Everybody they Everybody will call it the podium anyway. Yeah, I always just say podium. But maybe they, I guess they get a little bit more money for second. I guess True. you don't know if Pogaccia crashes out or what could ever happen in the future. Yeah. Second is always, you know, better to be second than third. So, yeah, I think, I think Carapaz will fight for second and try and put, Vingo got under pressure. I think that's the way he even rode today as well. Yep. I think he was trying to distance Jonas today. I think Jumbo Visma, I don't know. I, th- I feel like they can go for the stage win tomorrow with one of three riders with Ralph and Art in a break with Koos, yeah. Koos maybe riding off the G- from the GC group or or from a break or Jonas if, if Bogaccia feels generous as well. They lost another one today. Kreisbach is out. I is probably he? haven't told you yet. Jeez. He... Um, I don't know what happened. I think it was before the stage even, but I'm not sure about it. Uh, or during the start of the stage. So uh, they lost another one. They're now at four. So um, they're almost starting to look like Arkea, except for the fact that they're actually achieving what they're trying to do. And um, I think that one thing I do still want to mention is a short thing. Bilbao is not selected for the Olympics, and I can't wrap my head around it. Because like yeah. <laughs> the way he's riding and the way he's got the send skills... That fits him so well, and yeah, it's it's a shame. It's a real it's, shame. It's pretty weird, but the Olympic selections are often a bit strange. Like O'Connor didn't get picked for Australia when it was obvious he's one of the. He would have been really good on that park. Haig is out now, right? Or Haig's out. Uh, Cam Meyer's out. Hamilton's going. I don't know who's replacing Haig. Um, whether O'Connor's going or not, I don't think he is. So I, I don't know what's going on there, to be honest. Um, but yeah. We'll talk about Olympics when it comes around, but I'm glad the Tour de France had a good stage today with the GC, with some GC action. Tadej Pogacar and UAE honouring the race. I was scared of Eddie Merckx saying that I was going to, you know, DNF with a fake, fake injury. So I had to turn up for the podcast today, lest I incur his wrath. We hope you enjoyed the podcast. Let us know who do you think is, uh, yeah, who do you think is winning tomorrow's stage? I'm struggling to really. I don't really know. I don't really have a firm view on it, to be honest. Uh, I'll probably be guided by whatever's in uh, whatever I said in the preview. But if you enjoyed the recap, make sure to give us a like down below. Subscribe to the YouTube channel if that's where you listen or give us a review or a rating on podcast players. But until then, ciao.